God is dead. At least, that's what they said. Every major scholar in the world agrees a man from Nazareth walked this earth until they nailed him to a tree. Although I say they, I really mean we. We mocked and tortured him. He was nothing more than an animal we sought to put down. Some were calling him a king, so we buried thorns into his skull. Our disgust was his crown. Jesus, blasphemer. How could he claim to forgive the destruction men caused? That he could reconcile us with the only true God? That's why we strung him up and didn't care to watch him die. See, he was already dead to us. We were all enemies, rebels from the start. Even after deliverance from Egypt, Pharaoh never left our hearts. Like scoffers rejecting the ark, or a hospital torn down by patients, the creation killing their creator was always God's plan to save us. On a hillside outside Jerusalem, time still signal drop earth dark heart stop. What is time to one who has no beginning or end? It was his decision to step out of this world and his glory to step back in. We stripped divinity from a cross, placed his body in a cave to let the world mourn the rabbi who claimed he could save. We prepared a borrowed grave for this Jesus, Prince of Peace. Unaware, he had only signed for a three-day lease. Now this is where the stone comes, when the lion's been silent long enough. This is the resurrection on record. This is definitive proof of love. This is the beginning after every ending. This is mercy. This is grace. This is Jesus has defeated death. This is why we have church on Sundays. This is forgiveness. This is select all delete on our guilt. This is are you hungry for new life? Then come and have your fill. This is a God who is faithful every minute, every hour. This is victory and triumph. This is Holy Spirit power. This is the devil's worst nightmare. The lion of the tribe of Judah. This is heaven meets earth in harmony singing. Glory, hallelujah. This is for every country, every city, every culture, every tribe. This is why do you look for the living among the dead? He is risen. He's alive. There is a lion roaring. Jesus, the king of glory. I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. And on the third day, just as the scripture said, he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Most of them whom are still alive, though some have died. And then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. You know, this little creed has been circling around in about two, three years after the resurrection. I don't know if you know what creed is. Creed is the statement and the confession of faith that anytime they gather together after the resurrection of Christ, they gather in the house and they start declaring their, their faith. We call that creed. And then they start saying this little piece of creed that I just read to you that eventually was written down in the scripture. So again, creed is the statement and the confession of faith that they are saying together when they get together. Now, interestingly, 
someone named Bart Ehrman. He's actually the scholar of New Testament. He agreed, according to his study, he agreed that this creed, people started saying this creed in two, three years after the resurrection. By the way, have I told you that Bart Ehrman is an atheist? He's a scholar studying New Testament, but he's an atheist. But even Bart Ehrman does not oppose to the idea that this creed has been around since Jesus resurrected from the dead, as soon as two to three years. Now, the reason why is that is so important, because usually for an urban legend to develop, it takes about 150 years, right? The reason why it takes 150 years for urban legend to develop is because all of those people, the one or two generation, all of those original people who are involved in the original story, when they died, then the story can be developed without someone confirming it. But in two to three years after the resurrection, people started to declare this creed that Jesus was crucified, he was buried, and then he rose from the dead. And it also says that he was seen by his apostles, by his followers, by his disciples. And then he was seen by 500 eyewitnesses at one time. So when Jesus appeared to these 500 eyewitnesses, this is not like hallucination or this is not like uh, 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 appearing in a dream, right? Because 500 people at one time, they cannot have the same dream at one time. So he appeared physically to more than 500 of eyewitnesses after he rose from the dead. Again, the reason why it is so important because this is not an urban legend. The resurrection of Jesus is not an urban legend that started to develop hundreds of years after the actual event. Do you know that a piece of document of the uh, history, for example, the, the history of someone named Alexander the Great, do you know that the earliest document that recorded the life of Alexander the Great was actually written 400 years after Alexander the Great passed away. And, all, and most of historians still consider that document is very credible. After 400 years, can you imagine two, in two or three years after the resurrection, they start declaring their faith in Jesus? They start declaring the resurrection of Jesus? If that was not true, then those people that we just heard, that those people who are still alive can actually Confirm it. Hey, that didn't happen. That is not true. But those people who are still alive, we can actually ask them. Right? And in about, two, uh, in about 20 to 30 years, after the resurrection, then the gospel in your Bible were written. So 20 to 30 years, the gospel is a very credible source. Because this is not an urban legend. And there are some people who are still alive at the time. If this whole thing is not true, if this whole thing is fake, if this whole thing is just a hoax, then those people can confirm it. Why is the resurrection is such an important event? Especially for us, the follower of Jesus. Apostle Paul says this. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless. Your faith is useless. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then what are we doing here, fam? Right? What are we doing here? Everything that we do is useless. Our faith is useless. Us telling people about Jesus, us talking about Jesus, us gathering together and praying in the name of Jesus. All of those are useless if there is no resurrection. If resurrection never happened, then everything that we do is useless. That's why this one event the resurrection of Jesus, the day where we are celebrating right now, it is the foundation of our faith. It is the foundation of Christianity. 
The foundation of Christianity is not whether how come the dinosaurs is not included in the Bible, right? The foundation of our faith is how come God doesn't answer my prayer. The foundation of our faith is not how come God did not heal my parents, right? The foundation of Christianity is whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. And, and what it means is that if you have to struggle, if you have doubt, right, if you are a, a skeptic in Christianity, what you and me should investigate is the resurrection of Jesus, whether it happened or not, right? Because if it never happened, then Christianity is not true. But if Jesus did raise from the dead, then maybe we should take what Jesus said seriously. Our foundation of our faith, the foundation of our faith, again, is not, you know, I'm working with somebody who claimed to be Christian, but how come his act doesn't reflect uh, Jesus and all this? No, no, no. I know it's, it's too bad that happened. But the foundation of our Christian, our, our Christian faith is whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. Why is the resurrection of Jesus is important? I only have one point this morning. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Why? Because it proves that Jesus is who he claimed to be. The reason why the resurrection of Jesus changes everything, because it proves that Jesus, who he claims to be. Colossians 2 verse 9 says, For in Christ live all the fullness of God in human body. So all of God live in Jesus. That's what it says. All the fullness of God live in Jesus. The resurrection is so important because it, it can prove who Jesus claimed to be. Do you know that throughout the history, all the way to the recent history, right? A lot of people claim to be God. You have a lot of cult, a lot of followers of cult. Yeah, you have usually this one uh, uh, person, usually it's a guy, right, who claimed to be God and people come to worship them. Or even some of the big names throughout the history, like uh, uh, the Caesar of Rome or the King Pharaoh of Egypt, right? They all claim to be God. They wanted to, to become God, right? But when they died, they stay dead. Usually those cult movement, when the leader died, the movement stopped. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that it is one thing to claim something, but it is another thing to claim something and pull it off. I was, I was, I was reading about uh, the story about this one you know, social media influencer. Um, uh, him and his family, you know, they went to, uh, vaca on vacation to, uh, to Netherlands, I believe. And then when they check in into the hotel, there are a couple things that, that just, um, uh, you know, that, that was not right. So, so he, the social media influencer, went to the manager and went to the management and trying to tell them something, trying to uh, uh, put a complaint, right? And he can tell that this manager, I mean, they were listening, uh, they were listening, but they can tell that this manager didn't really take his complaint seriously. And finally, after he got tired of it, he just basically show the manager of the hotel how many followers that he has on social media. When he showed the management of the hotel, this guy has 75 million followers on Instagram. Now, just for a comparison, Barack Obama have about 36 million. Donald Trump have 24 million followers. This guy has 75 million followers. After he's shown that to the manager, now they start taking him seriously. Right? Because for this guy, it takes him one post. If he just posts one negative thing about this hotel, the reputation of the hotel is done. Right? Imagine if I come to the hotel management and I show them who I am. If I show them my Instagram, right? I have about 50 followers. Most of the people are from the church, right? It is one thing to claim something, but it is another thing to claim something and actually pull it off. Well, throughout the journey, throughout Jesus' journey, he claimed to be God. He claimed that he has the authority to forgive sin. 
He claimed that he's the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus told people who he is. Jesus told people that he and the Father, he and God are the same, are one. And Jesus also told people exactly what's going to happen to him. He's going to die. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. And then he also told people that he's going to raise from the dead. It is one thing to say all of these things, but it's another thing to actually say these things and pull it off. And Jesus pull it off. Romans 14 verse 9 says, Christ died and rose again for this very purpose to be, help me out, to be Lord both of the living and both uh, and of the death. He's shown us that he is in charge of life and death. He's shown us that he is in charge of the living and of the dead. So if all of those things Thing that Jesus claimed are true. If he's truly the Savior and the Messiah, if, 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 if what Jesus claimed about his death and his resurrection is true, if what Jesus claimed about himself is true, let me ask you this question. What else that Jesus say is true? Maybe we should consider what else that Jesus said that might be true. What if, let me ask you this, what if what Jesus says about this life is true? What if what he teaches about how we should live our life is true? What if what he says about marriage, about family, about relationship is true? What if what he says about money is true? What if what he says about our sexuality is also true? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh in the body of Jesus. He was living among us, and that's Jesus. In other words, what if the Word can be trusted? What if the word can be trusted? What if God has a great intention for your life and for my life? What if God, the reason why God is telling us and show us the way to live, not because he he doesn't want you to do this and he doesn't want you to do that, not because he's a party pooper trying to tell you what to do in life. No, because he had a great intention so that that you and me can experience what he said, uh, what he called the fullness of life. Jesus said, I come to give you life and life abundantly. I come to give you life and life to the full. What if the reason why he showed us how to live is because he wants us to experience the life that he has prepared for us? 2 Timothy 1, I'm using the Living Bible translation. It says that now he has made all of this plain to us by the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who broke the power of death and showed us the way of everlasting life through trusting in him that could not hold jesus down jesus has shown that this is the way to the everlasting life you know following jesus is not just about you know when we die we go to heaven it's not just that right Jesus didn't just show us the way to heaven. Jesus didn't just tell us, um, and, and Jesus didn't just talk about the afterlife, but he also showed us the way to the everlasting life now while we are on this earth, while we are here. Jesus promised that you will find the meaning of true life while you are alive on this earth. Jesus is our hope. Not only after we die, but he is our hope while we are alive now. Your hope and my hope in Jesus is secure and cannot be taken away. You know, someone says that that we always, 
in one of these three phases in our life, whether we are about to go into the storm, whether we are in the middle of the storm, or, we, or whether we are just got out of the storm. We are always in these three phases of life. Someone says that the storm of life, the crisis in life, uh, they are inevitable, they are impartial, they are variable, they are unpredictable. The storm of life is inevitable. inevitable. In other words, it's going to happen. We all going to experience it. We cannot avoid it. Impartial, meaning that it's going to happen to everybody, no matter what ethnicity you are, no matter what race you are, we are going to experience the storm of life. The storm of life is variable, come in different shape of forms, sickness, abuse, job loss, death, cancer, tragedy. The storm of life is unpredictable. We don't know when it's going to come. So the question is, where do we put our hope in? Just a couple years ago, we witnessed it with our own eyes. There's this thing called COVID that just shake the entire world. Everything that can be shaken was shaken, right? Where do we place our hope in? Jesus says this, I have told you these things so that you and me may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, be encouraged. Because I have overcome the world. The finished work of Jesus, his death and his resurrection, is the only secure place that we can put our hope in. It cannot be taken away from you and me. You know why? Because it's already happened. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It's done. So you are placing your hope in something that cannot be taken away from you. Let me close with this story. Just a couple days ago, a couple nights ago, uh, me and a good friend of mine, we were having conversation. And then we were talking about what happened in, in Baltimore. I think most of you know what happened in Baltimore where the thing hit the bridge and it collapsed, right? And then he started to make a comment like this, man, I think that's the worst way to die because it just happens so quickly. You know, by the way, I think something interesting, um, as some of you know that this past week is spring break for students, right? So me and a couple of friends, uh, we all have little kids. Uh, we were planning a, 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 a getaway, a couple of days of getaway during spring break together, right? So we have reserved a, a, a place in uh, Atlantic City. And then literally a day before we actually go there, the hotel actually called that the water heater is broken. So we canceled the reservation. We cannot stay there. And then we all trying to discuss where should we go? Right? Poconos, Lancaster, or State in Atlantic City. And out of all places, we choose to go to Baltimore. Now, I'm not going to make this story dramatic, you know. It's not like, oh man, we were supposed to be on that bridge. And then, you know, no, no, because it happened at 1.30 in the morning, right? But I just thought it is very uh, interesting how we woke up Tuesday morning, we, we look at our phone and we saw the news and that bridge, that bridge is only about 18 minutes away from our hotel. But anyway, back to the conversation between me and my friend. He was, he was saying like, well, I think that's the worst way to die. Why? Because it happens so quick. You don't even get a chance to prepare. You don't even get a chance to say goodbye to your loved one. And I think his take, also very interesting, it's because a few weeks ago, a, a couple of us also lost a friend. And, and, and he, the way he passed away, it was so sudden. You know, he was okay in one afternoon, and then the next morning they found him in, in, in his room, not breathing. 
And, and when, when we saw a lot of friends, we, we heard a couple comments also say that that's actually the best way to die. Where it happens so quickly, you don't have to endure some type of sickness, you don't have to stay in the hospital, right? You don't have to uh, uh, give uh, your family or people around you trouble by taking care of you. So my question this morning, which one is it? Is it better to happen suddenly, you know, when, when, when we don't have to, again, to prepare anything, we don't have to uh, trouble anyone? Or is it better to prepare when we have the opportunity to say, good morning, which one is it? I mean, honestly, death is one of the greatest mystery, right? We all have to face it. And all the people say that then death is just part of life. Death is just something natural. But what if I said this morning that death is not natural? What if I said to you this morning that once upon a time, death is not part of our life? When God first created human beings, when God first created the world, death was not part of our life. God says this, you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden if you, and you must not touch it or you will die. And of course, we decided that we want to do our own thing. We, de- you know, we decided to do what we want. We decided that God cannot be trusted, right? We decided that we actually know better we decided that we actually know what's best for us. That's why we, we go against what God says. And as soon as sin entered the world, death become part of us. For the wages of sin is death. But can I tell you the good news this morning? Thank God that's not the end of our story. For the wages of sin is dead, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that a good news? It's free for you and me, but it cost God everything. It cost God His Son, Jesus Christ, in order for Him to give us eternal life. So let me ask you this. If God have gone to a great length to provide you and me His grace and His eternal life through Jesus, what stop you from receiving that gift? What stop you from receiving that gift this morning? Is that okay if I invite all of you to stand up? And we just want to take a couple minutes just to reflect on the things that we heard today. I pray that the Holy Spirit right now, right at this moment, will speak to each and every one of you today. What is it that He's trying to tell you today? Maybe there are some of you who never heard about this amazing gift that God has prepared for all of us. The grace of God through Jesus Christ, where you and me, we don't have to pay for our own sin because Jesus Christ has paid for our sin on the cross. That there's going to be this eternal life that He has prepared for us after life. And there's also this fullness of life that He has prepared for us while we are on this planet Earth. If you never heard that before, i like to give you some opportunity just to pray this prayer. You don't have to pray it out loud. But you can pray something like this. Jesus, I invited you into my life. I acknowledge that you have died on the cross for my sin, my past sin, my present sin, and my future sin. Jesus, I invited you to be Lord and Savior in my life. 
from now on it is no longer I who live but you Christ who live in me from now on you are the king of our life from now on you are in charge in my life from now on we acknowledge that the Holy Spirit the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now live inside of me the ones that are going to help me to live and to try my best each and every day to be more and more like Jesus and to honor God with my life. Maybe there are some of you here. You are familiar with this story. You actually believe this story. You believe everything that we talk about this morning, but you just never take a step forward to surrender your life fully to God. Maybe some of you are still trying to be in control of your life. Maybe some of you are trying to be in charge of your life. But God is saying to, to you guys this morning, come on, surrender your life to me. Give your life to me, God says and you will see what I'm gonna do with your life. You will see what you're gonna experience in your life, in your marriage, in your career, in everything that you do in life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. I love this picture, that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. The stone that covered the entrance to the tomb has been removed. See, the stone was removed not so that because, so not so that Jesus can come out from the tomb, do you know that the stone was removed so that you and me can come to Jesus? There is no more barrier between us and God. There is no more separation between you and God and all of this because what Jesus has done. Because of Jesus, your relationship with God has changed forever. The stone was removed so that now you and me, we can approach God, we can come to the throne of His grace boldly. With our confidence, we can come to God knowing that now we are His children. So I pray that whatever next step that you going to have to take in your faith journey, that you will have the courage to take it. For some of us, again, maybe we should surrender our life to Jesus because we never did it. For some of us, maybe we've been a Christian for some time, maybe our next step is to get baptized. For some of you, maybe the next step is to start surrendering your life and give your life to serve God. For some of you, maybe it is time for you to discover the talent that God has given you, the calling that God has placed in your life. For some of you, maybe the next step is to offer your life and to surrender your life to God and start and actually leave the life that is not honoring to God. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. But God says, don't be afraid. When you honor me with your life, again, you will see what I'm going to do. Father God, again, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you gather us here on Easter Sunday morning. We pray, Lord, the amazing grace that you have prepared for us, that none of us will reject it. None of us will wait any longer to receive that amazing grace that you have available for us. 
we thank you, Lord. Bless the rest of our day. I speak blessing over you. May all the good and perfect things that come from heaven will be upon you and will follow you for the rest of your life. And in Jesus' name we pray. All of us say, Amen. Come on, all of us say, Amen. Amen. Happy Easter, everyone. Please tell somebody next to you, Happy Easter. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your, uh, of your day.